Welcome everyone to the webinar. This is Speed Reading and Memorization Techniques. My name is Paul Novak. I'm the Founder and Program Director here at Iris Reading and Study Maven. Study Maven being a division of Iris Reading uh, that focuses a little more on college students. What we do at Iris is uh, we teach speed reading and memorization techniques to uh, students and professionals. We do them online, as you can see, and also we do them in person. So we've done these classes and workshops uh, in over 40 cities across the US uh, and Canada. We're also starting to do this internationally. So I want to thank you so much for attending today's session. This one is obviously geared a lot more towards college related reading. But I think you'll find this helpful because you know reading is something that, you know, think about this. When was the last time you learned how to read? For most people, the last time they learned how to read, it was the first time they learned how to read. So um, this is no hooked on phonics session. You already know how to read well. Um, I mean, you might not feel that way, but like you wouldn't have gotten to where you are right now had you had horrible reading skills. Now, the goal is to move them up a notch, to take you know whatever reading skills you have right now and get some advanced level skills. How do you read faster? How do you maintain comprehension? What if you have to memorize something? Think about all the times you've been told to memorize something for school, but how many times have you been taught here's how you memorize something. So that's a lot of what we do here at IRIS and what we're going to cover today in the session, several things. How fast you currently read, we're actually going to measure your reading speed and you'll see where you fall. Is it average, above average, below? You'll find that out today. Also, we'll cover how to read faster with comprehension. A lot of speed reading programs, they focus way too much on speed and not enough on comprehension. You need to understand what you're reading if you're going at a higher rate, obviously. Also, how do you read faster on the computer screen? A lot of us students and professionals now are spending a lot more time reading on the screen. And believe it or not, the average person reads a little slower on the computer screen compared to reading on the printed page. And of course, there's a variety of reasons for that. We'll get into that later on. Also, how and when to take notes. So, you know, if you're a student and you're studying, it's a mix of, you know, you're reading, every so often you've got to take notes. Note taking does aid your memory. So we'll talk about some uh, ideal ways to take notes while you're reading. And also memorization techniques. As we mentioned, uh, it's not just enough of, uh, you know, did you understand the material, but sometimes you need to memorize very specific information for maybe a test or maybe a presentation that you're doing. And we'll cover a memorization technique I think you'll find very, very helpful later on in this webinar. So a little bit about us. Uh, if you're not already familiar with us at Iris Reading, uh, as I mentioned, we teach speed reading and memorization courses. And the way I got involved doing this, I actually learned speed reading during my freshman year of college. Uh, I was a so-so reader throughout like high school and grade school. And, but when I got to college, this is when I first started falling behind. I always considered myself more of a numbers guy. I always excelled in anything math related and then you know, when I had those reading tests that you've probably taken as well, I always didn't score so well because I would run out of time. I just wasn't reading fast enough to get through the entire test. So I get to college and it's my freshman year. I'm taking five classes. Uh, I had a part-time job on the weekends. I was also on the basketball team. So I'd pr that's like having another part-time job. So my day went from, uh, my first class was eight in the morning. This is my first semester of college. Eight in the morning, I'd finish up around 2 p.m. I'd have basketball practice from three to about seven. And then I would hit the library for a couple hours, maybe two, three hours come home sometimes 9, 10, 11 at night. I was a commuter student, so I'd get on the train at 7 in the morning. I'd be coming back home around 11. Little by little, this started wearing me down. And uh, a lot of you might feel a little worn out yeah, as, as you've progressed through the semester. Um, for me, after like five, six weeks, I felt like, you know, I, I was looking at my grades up to that point on quizzes and things like that. I was behind in a lot of my classes. The grades were not, not as great, even though I was putting a lot of effort. And I had one professor who suggested to me because I was meeting up with him during his office hours to try to get help. Uh, one professor I had suggested I take a speed reading course. And he told me that he took one when he was in college. It helped him out a lot. So he suggested that I do the same. And I looked around for a speed reading course, and I couldn't find any at the time in Chicago. That's where I was born and raised. That's where I went to school. I couldn't find any speed reading workshops at all. So I went back to my professor, and I just asked him, hey, uh, couldn't find that speed reading program you told me about is no longer around. Couldn't find any other ones. And I asked him, hey, you'd learned speed reading years ago. Can you, uh, you know, teach me how it works? And he agreed to let me come in during his office hours. And I would come in for like an hour, hour and a half at a time uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I remember my first session with him, he measured my reading speed. And we're going to measure your reading speed in a few moments here. But I remember I started out at 190 words per minute. Now, he also gave me a standardized reading test. 
by the way, the 190, that was around average, and I was actually relieved to know that I was an average reader because I always thought I was below average. Um, I always felt like I was kind of a slow reader. Happy to know I was average, but this professor told me, he's like, you should not be content with 190 words a minute. Um, if you want to keep up with all the reading that I assign and your other classes assign, you want to be closer to 400 words a minute or higher. So he gives me the standardized reading test, and we've all taken this. Re read this passage and then you know answer these questions. I remember scoring a, a lousy 60% on it, mainly because I didn't finish it. So we start training, and uh, you know, like I said, hour, hour and a half a day, I was going on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We did a variety of drills and exercises. And after about nine, 10 hours of training, a few weeks later, I, I started out at 190. My final speed when I was working with this professor, I went from 190 to 830. And as far as my comprehension goes, first time around I had a 60% on the test, second time around I finished it no problem, went from 60% to 83%, mainly because it was simple to get through that test, go back, check answers. And I hate to sound cliche and call it a life-changing experience, but when you're going a little, a little over four times faster, that helps you in many, many ways. For me it was, well, now I'm going to catch up with all my reading. I was behind in every class except calculus because there was no reading to do in calculus. But I was catching up in my history class, English literature class, a bunch of other classes where I was behind. Started keeping up with the material. My freshman year I pulled off a perfect GPA. Now I didn't maintain a perfect GPA because college gets harder as you go through it. And of course you start slacking off a little bit by your senior year. But this helped me tremendously going through school. Uh, my sophomore year I actually had a big change. I had to uh, start working full time. Uh, my parents needed some financial assistance, and I didn't want to drop out of college. I wanted to, you know, maintain full-time status, so I started scheduling all my, all my classes at night. So I'd go to school from, you know, I'd work, actually, from 8 in the morning to about 3.30, 4 o'clock. I found a job working in finance. That was my major. I was a finance major. I started working on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. I don't know if you've ever seen on the news where they're talking about the markets and, um, all these people on the floor yelling their heads off. Um, I used to work down there at the Chicago Board of Trade, and after market hours were over, around 4 o'clock, I'd walk over to campus. I was going to school at DePaul University, and I would take my classes from 6 to 9.15 at night. Monday through Friday, that was my schedule. So it was like a 40-hour job and full-time work. If I was still reading at 190, that would have been impossible to maintain and graduate in four years on time. So being able to read faster helped me in amazing ways, but the way I started teaching speed reading, when I would get out of work, I'd go to campus, sit in the student lounge, catch up with whatever reading had to be done, and every so often a friend of mine or a classmate would see me reading, and they would ask me, like, hey, are you skimming or are you actually reading that fast? And I told them, I would tell them that I took some speed reading, you know, like a one-on-one -on -one class with the professor. I told them I knew some speed reading techniques, and I almost always got a follow-up question, like, well, how does that work? What do you do? And I'd get these questions throughout college, and finally it's my senior year, and I have to take uh, one more class on a Thursday evening. I need one more elective, and the only class that would fit was an entrepreneurship class. And in that class, we had to come up with a business idea, write a business plan, and actually execute part of that business plan. So because I kept getting questions about speed reading, I figured I'd start a little speed reading tutoring service on campus. And this was just part of a class project. This is actually how Iris originally began. Um, it was during my senior year of college, part of a class project. I started posting some flyers on campus saying that I teach people speed reading. I started getting some emails from students that were interested. And I would teach them on weekends because I already had a full-time job. And one of the things I found was I loved teaching. It was just a, a passion of mine. I, I didn't want to become like a, a high school teacher or like a college professor, but I just enjoyed sharing information. So I kept on doing this after I graduated. Now, I had a full-time job offer when I graduated. I took that job offer. I continued working in finance for a number of years, but Iris was something that I was developing on the side, in the evenings, on the weekends, doing a lot of research, not just on speed reading, but also memory, how your memory works and how you can memorize information. And little by little, Iris started becoming we started growing. We started hiring other employees, training new instructors. Uh, we started doing classes in other cities. And eventually I quit my full-time job in finance, and this is what I do full-time now. We've, as I mentioned, over 40 cities across the U.S., from students at Harvard to employees at Google, NASA. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, reading underlies so much of what we do. So I'm really happy you guys came out here. I, and I want to get, I'm sorry for going out. I wanted to give you an idea how I got involved with this. But let's get right into what we're going to cover today. Well, first of all, our focus as an organization, as I mentioned, speed. You want to read faster. Comprehension. You want to understand what you're reading. 
and retention. You want to remember what you're reading. Uh, all three of these matter equally. Um, if you want to be an effective and an efficient reader, you need all three of these. Now, we want to start by measuring your reading speed. Let's get a baseline and figure out where you are right now. So in a few moments, on the screen, you're going to see this article. Now, don't start reading it yet. I'm going to move away from the article so you can't see it. Uh, but in a moment, you'll see that article flash on the screen. I am going to measure your reading speed for just a single minute to begin with. Now, during that minute, all you got to do is read the way you normally would. Don't try to go faster than you normally would. Uh, don't go slower than you normally would. You want to get an accurate idea of how fast you currently read. So you're just going to read from the screen. We're going to read for a minute. At the end of the minute, you'll hear my timer go off. I got my timer right here. Sounds like that. At the end of that minute, you'll stop and you'll look at the line where you stopped. You'll see a number that corresponds with how fast you were currently reading. So everyone should be ready. We're going to go ahead and read. Go ahead and begin. Okay, let me stop you right there. That was one minute of regular reading, and look at the line where you stopped. Uh, for example, uh, these numbers, just so you know, they correspond to how many words are up to the final word on that line. So make sure you take note of your reading speed right now. And by the way, this number, uh, if you stopped somewhere in the middle of a line, let's say you stopped right here on the word several, well, you just take the number from the previous line, 236, and if you stopped right here, you would just count the rest of the words, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you would add the 4 to the 236, making it 240. Uh, so go ahead and take note of your reading speed. Very important that you do that right now. And actually, we have a, a little poll that I can pull up. You should see it on your screen in a few moments. I'm going to launch the poll. Go ahead and let us know how fast you currently read. And this is a words per minute number. So go ahead and uh, select. Were you somewhere between zero to nine? I, I mean, I'm assuming you didn't do zero words per minute, probably at least one, right? Um, maybe you were 100 to 199. Were you 200 to 299? Go ahead and uh, I see most people have voted, so I'm going to close the poll and I will actually, uh, let's go ahead and broadcast the results here. So you see on your screen here, most of you were somewhere in the range of uh, 100, 200 to 299. That was 50%. 25% uh, of you were 100 to 199. We don't have anyone lower than 100, so that's good. Um, and in a moment, I'll show you what the average is. But this is uh, where most of you, if we had to say most, like 75%, you can see, landed somewhere between 100 and 300, basically. Now, if you're wondering what the average is, let me hide the results here. Let's go back to the slides. If you're wondering what the average reading speed is, for adults in the U.S., now, uh, the webinar that we're doing here, just about all of you here are college students, so this is the average for adults in the U.S., 150 to 250. For college students, it's more like 200 to 300. So that's just to give you an idea of what the average is, and I, I want you to know a few things about this average. First of all, it's based on medium level material. So this article right here, this is medium level. By that I mean not too easy and not too hard. I think all of us would agree this is not advanced level physics, and it's also not um, the cat in the hat. It's not a children's book. So when you have medium level material, this is the average reading speed. Also, again, as I mentioned, adults in the U.S., if you, were, if you had uh, children reading, these numbers would obviously be lower. And, of course, uh, generally speaking, um, Students that have completed college tend to read a little faster. It's usually 200 to 300. But this is an average number for adults in the U.S. 
Also, I want you to know that this average used to be a little bit higher. Uh, 30 years ago, do you think this number was higher or lower? Uh, it, was actually, uh, it was actually a little higher. Uh, 30 years ago, the average reading speed was around 250 to 350. So it's a bit of a problem that the average has dropped. Now, why has it dropped? I think part of the reason is, think about this. If you were a college student 30 years ago, uh, while you're reading, your mobile phone is not going to go off, right? You're not going to get a text message. You're not going to have the urge to check Facebook or email. There's a lot more. What I mean is uh, there's a lot more things competing for our attention now and put, that could potentially distract us compared to 30 years ago. So that, that's why I think the average reading speed has gone down a bit. Now, don't worry. It's probably not going to zero. And you can actually raise your speed. It doesn't matter if you're below average, average, or above average. We can make improvements. So let's discuss the easiest way to start reading faster. Well, one very simple thing you could do right now is start using your hand as a guide. Here's what I mean by this. Using your hand as a guide, going from left to right, line by line. So you could use your finger, you could even use a pen. There's a reason why using your hand or a pen is useful. It's because your eyes are naturally attracted to motion. Uh, think about it this way. If there was a bee flying around in your room right now, it would be a little distracting, right? One, because it's a bee, and two, because anything that moves around is just naturally going to get your attention. That's how all human beings are wired. So when you're moving your hand across the page from left to right, line by line, your eyes will naturally follow your finger or your pen. And this is the easiest way you can improve your concentration while you're reading. Now, another thing to think about is when you point to something, your eyes will naturally zero in and focus on it much better than if you're just staring without some kind of a guide. Now, I do understand that using your hand as a guide, usually when I mention this, the first thing people think of is, well, what about reading on the computer screen? I don't want to be, you know, moving my hand on, on my monitor, on my laptop, or if you have a you know, touch screen, that's definitely not practical. So later on, we're going to cover how to, you know, how to read faster on the computer screen. There's a different method that you can use that doesn't require to use your hand as a guide. But anytime you have physical material, you know, like an actual, an actual book or a magazine or you know maybe there's a PDF that you printed using your hand as a guide can be helpful also I you could technically use your mouse as a guide but I'm using I'm on a laptop right now and if I'm going from left to right my mouse pad is only so big I can only go like this it's not that easy it's easier if I had an external mouse but we'll talk about reading on the screen a little later but if you have physical printed material using your hand as a guide can be very helpful now, let's discuss how most people tend to read, because we have to make some changes if we're going to start reading faster. You see this little green dot bouncing around on the screen? Let's say this green dot represents your eyes looking at each and every single word. This is how most people tend to read. And, of course, every so often you do one of these. You ever go like this and you're like, wait, whoa, 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 hold on, i got to back up. Ah, yes, there we go. Okay, now, <laughs> we've all done this. Well, there are three old reading habits that we need to change if we're going to start reading faster. And one of these old reading habits is called fixation. Fixation is just something that your eyes do. They fixate on a word-by-word -word basis. Remember that little green dot bouncing around? That's how most people read. They'll look at one word and then the next word, next word, next word. Uh, now, these fixations happen in the split of a second. Um, why? Because you've seen these words many times. Now, when you were younger, you might stare at a word longer because... You know, you had to break it down syllable by syllable. Like the word university, you would look at it and go, university. You don't do that anymore. You see university, and you've seen that word many times. So you look at it for a split moment, and then you move on to the next one. The reason why this is an old reading habit is because you can read more than one word. At this point in your life, you're fluent with your reading. You don't have to break words down syllable by syllable, unless you've never seen those words before, um, or if they're like very, very long words. But for the most part, even in very technical information, you know, more than 90% of the words you've seen many, many times. So you can read groups of words, and actually, uh, you already read groups of words sometimes without realizing it. I'll give you an example. When you're driving a car, and uh, let's say you were driving towards New York City, and you saw an exit sign on the highway that had three words, New York City. How many fixations would your eyes make? I mean, you'd be driving, and you would look at the sign, and then you'd look back at the road. You wouldn't look at the sign and make three tiny fixations on New York City. No. But if the words New York City were buried in the middle of some paragraph, well, most people would kind of bounce around like New York City. That's 
how most people tend to read. So th this habit of fixation is an old reading habit, needs to be changed. We need to read groups of words if we want to start reading faster. Now, another old reading habit is something called regression. And we've all done this, right? You ever, you ever read a whole, let's say you read a whole page. You ever look up and wonder like, all right, I have no clue what I just read. You know, I've been reading for maybe five minutes or 10 minutes or more. And sometimes your mind is just blank or we, our mind has been wandering while we're reading. Uh, the fancy word for this is, they call it regression. Uh, sometimes they also call it mindless reading, <laughs> uh, where you could be just thinking about something else. And then, of course, you have to go back and reread whatever it is you missed. So this obviously has a lot to do with concentration. And one simple way you can reduce this habit is by using your hand as a guide. It improves your ability to focus. And of course, there's other ways that you can improve your focus, but the reason we go back usually is because our mind wanders off and we're not concentrating effectively. Now, there's a third old reading habit, and this one is one of the harder ones to change. Remember when you were first learning how to read, your teacher would have you, you know, you have to get up in front of class and you have to read out loud. Do you remember the dread, this dreadful experience? I say dreadful because uh, I used to hate reading out loud in front of class because uh, when I first started learning how to read around, like, I don't know, age five, six, you know, when you're in kindergarten, first grade, um, I was just learning English at the time. Uh, my primary language is Polish. Both of my parents are immigrants from Poland. They came to Chicago, and I was born in Chicago, but didn't start speaking English until like five, six years old. I did, I did not like reading out loud because I always used to mess up on words. And eventually, you don't have to read out loud. Eventually, what does your teacher tell you to do? Instead of saying the words out loud, say the words silently in your head, right? Say the words to yourself. And the name of this habit, it's known as subvocalization. Subvocalization is that voice you hear in your head while you're reading. So let me ask you, do you hear voices in your head while you're reading? Now, it doesn't mean you're crazy if you're hearing voices in your head. Um, they're your, it's your voice. <laughs> if it's another voice, you might be in the wrong session here today. Um, but this habit of saying words in your head, it's common among all readers. They say the word in their head. And the problem with it is it comes down to this. Do I have to say the word to understand what it means? Uh, not necessarily. I'll give an example of when you are reading, but you don't say words in your head. When you're, again, when you're driving, if you see a stop sign, do you actually say stop in your head? Probably not. You know, think of all the billboards you see on a daily basis. You know, uh, I'm broadcasting here today from downtown Chicago, and if every few blocks that you walk, you run into like a Starbucks, and it always says the full name of the company, Starbucks Coffee. You know, when you're walking by a Starbucks, you don't actually say in your head Starbucks Coffee. You just see it, and you get it. Uh, so this habit of subvocalization actually slows us down, and here's why. If you're saying every word in your head, doesn't that mean that you're going to read basically as fast as you talk? Now, there's a limit to how fast you can talk. You can only, I mean, you can try talking faster, but you'll approach a limit, um, and for most people that limit is in like the 300s. If you're talking 300 some words a minute, that's a very fast talking speed. You know, people that do uh, auctions, you know, auctioneers or people that do disclaimers at the end of commercials, those people are going somewhere in the 300s. It's a fast talking speed. But what is the average talking speed? Well, guess what? You saw it earlier. Remember I said the average reading speed is 150 to 250? Guess what the average talking speed? It's exactly the same. The average reader goes as fast as the average talker. It's 150 to 250. And why is that? It's because of this habit right here. Subvocalization is the reason why most people read as fast as they talk. And that's why we want to change this habit. Because you don't want to get stuck reading as fast as you talk. You want to be able to read as fast as you can think. Your thinking speed is much, much faster than your ability to verbalize words. So these are three old reading habits we have to change. And you know, if you're going to change anything or if you want to get better at anything, what do you have to do? You've got to practice. Now, we're talking about practice here. So how, how exactly does that work when we're talking about reading? Well, when you're talking about reading and practice, there's a difference between just reading books and practicing your ability to get better as a reader. So I want to go over something called speed drills. And speed drills are something very simple you can practice on your own. And they're actually something that we practice extensively in our courses. We have courses that are uh, live, in person. They're usually like week weekend courses that are like four hours. Uh, we also have online versions of those courses. But we do a lot of these speed drills. And I want to take you through a basic example of how they work. So the whole goal of a speed drill, and by the way, this speed drill I'm going to discuss is one of many 
exercises you can do to start improving your reading speed and comprehension. But one type of speed drill works very, very simply. You have to go faster than you would normally read. So how exactly would you do that? Well, the goal when you're doing these speed drills is to see words at a speed that's about double your normal reading speed. So that's your goal when you're doing speed drills. So let me give you an example. Let's say you were reading for 20 minutes. So 20 minutes is spent reading and you get through X amount of pages. So when you do a speed drill, your goal is to go double your normal reading speed. So the easiest way to, to do that is to go over material you've already read. So this 20 minutes of reading that you just did, go back to the beginning and get through that same material in half the time, 10 minutes. So essentially you're skimming over through, you're skimming through material that you've already read. Now you're doing it in half the time so you can shoot for a speed that's like two times your normal reading speed. Now of course when you're doing this because you're going over material you already read it's not it doesn't really count as reading. This is a practice exercise and we call it a speed drill where you're focusing on seeing the words at two times your normal speed. You're not you're not actually reading. You already read the material for 20 minutes. Now this is just one example. Another example of this drill could be I don't know, let's say you read for 30 minutes well, then your drill would be 15 minutes going through that same material you just read. And the, the reason why these drills work, here's how it works. It's, um, let, let's say, actually, we read for one minute on this article. Remember this uh, short article? And let's say you read up to, I don't know, let's say you finished the first two paragraphs. and You read 250 words per minute. Uh, now, this is, a very, this is like a micro drill, but let's say you read for a minute and you had to get through that same material in 30 seconds. Let's actually try that out right now. I'm going to put 30 seconds on the clock here. And what I want you to do, just so you can get a taste of how these drills work, I want you to zoom through all that material that you previously read in one minute. I want you to get through it in 30 seconds. So you purposely have to go faster than you would normally read. Now, you already read this material, so I just want you to focus on seeing the words at a much faster rate. Don't worry if you feel like you're missing some stuff. And of course, you already read this earlier, so you had some level of comprehension. But just focus on seeing the words faster. Let's try it out. We're going to do one drill real quick. Make sure you get to the previous points that you read up to in 30 seconds. Ready, set, and go. Okay, let me stop you there. That was 30 seconds. Now, that was, again, to give you a taste of how these drills would work. Now, if you didn't make it to the point that you previously read up to, you know, if you did these, let's say you're reading for 10 minutes, you try to get through that 10 minutes of reading in 5 minutes. You just need to go fo force yourself to go faster than you would normally read. Now, why, wh why do we do these speed drills? Because that's, that's the ultimate uh, question. Well, I like to compare these drills to driving a car on the highway. So when you're on the highway, let's say you're going 70 miles an hour, there's no traffic, and it's for an extended period of time, maybe 30 minutes or an hour, and eventually you have to get off the highway. How does it feel when you get off the highway? Doesn't it feel kind of slow? So think about it. Sometimes you get off the highway and you're still going 40 or 50 miles an hour, and you don't realize it because you got used to going maybe 70. So the way the speed drills work, it's very much like being on the highway, so to speak. You're going at a rate that's double your normal reading speed. So let's say if you read at 250 words a minute, you're going 500. Now comprehension, everything's just, you know, words are going in and out of your head. You're going much faster than usual. But if you get used to going at 500 words a minute, well then later, when you drop your speed down to something like 300, it's not going to feel as fast anymore. Why? Because you've trained your eyes to see words at a much greater speed, 500 words a minute. So. For example, remember we said the average reading speed is 150 to 250. Let's say you were let's say you were reading at 200 words a minute. Well, then your practice speed should be 400. Why? So you could get to something like 250. Now, when I say get to something like 250, I mean reading with comprehension at 250 words a minute. Now, if this is your current reading speed, you should be practicing at a rate that's closer to around 500 words a minute. Now this doesn't have to be exact, but I'm saying around. And the way you would practice that, remember I said with the drills, 
just read for a period of time and then get through the same material in half the time. That's the easiest way to do a drill like this. And if you practice at 500, eventually a speed like 300 is going to be a little easier to get through the material. You'll be comprehending at that rate. And if you're at 300, you practice at 6 and so on and so forth. And this is a step-by-step -step approach to building up your reading speed with what we call speed drills. And again, this is one type of drill that you can practice on your own. So again, read for a period of time and then get through the same material in half the time. Now, I want to shift gears and talk about improving comprehension. When you're going at higher speeds, um, you know, it really doesn't matter if you're going at higher speeds if you're not understanding anything. So we need some effective ways of getting better comprehension. I want to go over a very simple strategy that you can start utilizing right away. And it doesn't take much practice to implement this. So the easiest way to improve comprehension is to slow down and speed up at key points. So I know we're using this driving analogy a lot, but again, let's say you're driving and you have to make this turn. You're probably not going to make this turn at 80 miles an hour, you probably want to slow it down. And when you're reading, you shouldn't always read at the same speed, just like you wouldn't drive at the same speed. Sometimes you should slow down, and other times you should maybe speed up a little. Now, when I say slow down and speed up, I, I mean within reason. You're not slowing down to like 10 words per minute, and you're not speeding up to like 10,000 words per minute. It's a gradual, you know, a subtle increase or a subtle decrease. Now, here's a very simple way to implement this. A good rule of thumb is to slow down on the first sentence of each paragraph. So you can see on the screen here, I've got a one-page article. Uh, the title of this article is India's Skills Famine. And if you were reading this, a good way to improve your comprehension would be to slow down on that first sentence. And then after the first sentence, you speed up a little. Now, why would you slow down on the first sentence? I think it's pretty obvious to you, right? What is the first sentence usually? It's usually the main idea or the topic sentence. However you want to call it, that first sentence will tell you, uh, here's what we're going to talk about in this paragraph and now we're going to start talking about it. Uh, or here's my argument and here's my supporting evidence or details. Uh, let me zoom in on this first paragraph here so you can see what I mean. This first paragraph reads, the economic transformation of India is one of the great business stories of our time. Sound like a main idea? It sure does to me. So you would take that and now you're trying to run with it. You go a little faster through the paragraph. Now when you get to the second paragraph, here's the second paragraph, you would slow down again. You see it says, but India has run into a surprising hitch on its way to superpower status. Its inexhaustible supply of workers is becoming exhausted. Okay, another main idea. And then we speed up a little bit. Next paragraph. How is this possible in a country that every year produces 2.5 million college graduates and 400,000 engineers? Another main point. It's in the form of a question, but it gives you a lot of information. Look at the next paragraph. There was a time when many economists believed that post-secondary education didn't have much impact on economic growth. You see how all these first sentences are giving us a ton of information? While we're at it, there's just a couple more paragraphs here. The irony of the current situation is that India was once considered to be overeducated. Another main idea. Look at this one. Since the Second World War, the countries that have made successful leaps from developing to developed status have all poured money, public and private, into education. And look at the last paragraph. The same thing is happening over and over again. All these are main ideas. India has taken tentative steps to remedy its skills famine. The current government has made noises about doubling spending on education, and a host of new colleges and universities have sprung up since the mid-1990s. So I just read the first sentence of each one of those paragraphs out loud for you. You see how you can get a lot of information just from those main ideas? And if you slow down there and then speed up a little, that's an effective way of improving your comprehension, and here's why. You pay more attention to things when the speed is going up and down. For example, if you're driving in the middle of a city like downtown Chicago or New York or Los Angeles, there's a lot of things you have to pay attention to. You're constantly slowing down and speeding up while you're driving. How much do you have to pay attention if you're on a straight road driving through a rural area where there's just cornfields everywhere, there's no traffic? You're not paying as much attention in that kind of a scenario because you might just have the cruise control on and you just go 70 miles an hour for a period of time. Changing up speed forces you to pay attention, and that improves your comprehension. Just like you ever have a teacher in the past, I remember I had a few teachers in high school, they would speak in a monotone voice like this throughout the entire, and when someone speaks that way, it, uh, it's very easy for your mind to wander off. Why? Because normally when most people talk, and you're having an engaging conversation with someone, the speed at which you talk won't stay constant, it will sometimes change. Sometimes you'll talk a little slower. Other times you might talk a little faster. And that actually forces the other person 
to pay attention without them even realizing it. And the same is true when we're reading. If you slow down a little bit and speed up, it actually forces you, it's a, it's a trick to help you concentrate better. And by the way, this works even more effectively if you're reading technical information. This is not necessarily technical material, but if you're reading your textbook, this would work even better. Now let's talk about reading on the computer screen because uh, this can be frustrating, especially because there's so much distraction. You know, when I'm reading a, when I'm reading a, a physical book, you know, halfway through my chapter, I'm not going to get some pop-up ad, you know, that comes out of, a book. unless you're reading a children's book, you might get some pop-ups. But, you know, normal reading on a physical printed page, you're not having these kind of distractions. When you're online, you've got, you know, some video ad that might want to run, you might have an overlay, there, and there's also personal distractions. You might have the urge to check, you know, how many people liked my new profile picture on Facebook? Or let me see if so-and-so got back to me by email. There's a lot of ways to get distracted, and the average reader reads a little slower on the screen. The last study I saw uh, was about five, six years ago, and they took adults uh, in the U.S. reading on desktop monitors, and they were reading about 32% slower on the computer screen. So I want to go over a, an application that we developed here at IRIS, and it's a free speed reading tool that you can use, and it helps you read faster on the screen. And I'm going to show you how to use it right now, uh, but it's called Accelerator. So let me back up for a moment here. Um, Accelerator uh, you'll see how it's spelled in a moment. Uh, you go to accelerator.com, and what you do is you take some text that you want to read, and you copy and paste the material into the program. So let's take an example article here from The Onion. World scientists admit they just don't like mice. So you copy the text you want to read, as you see there, and then you go to accelerator.com, and that's where you paste the text in the box. So we're going to delete that, paste the new material, and we're going to hit begin. Now, in the middle of the screen, those are the first two words of the article. When we start reading, you're going to notice the words blink on the screen at 300 words a minute. Let's try it out. Okay, I think you get the idea of uh, how this works. Uh, as you probably noticed, uh, the words were blinking on the screen. You probably noticed they were blinking two at a time. Uh, I actually set that ahead of time. The default is one word at a time, but I recommend you do at least two words at a time because you're perfectly capable, as I mentioned, of reading groups of words. So there's a lot of things you can do with this. We're actually working on turning this into an iPhone and an Android app. We'll keep you posted about that. Uh, but right now, this exists as a web-based uh, application. You just copy and paste text. It, you, so long as you can copy the text and paste it in, it'll work for you. And uh, we're working on making other advanced uh, features on the program. Actually, there is a feature right now that will slow down and speed up for you. Remember how we talked about that? So there's a lot of cool things you can do with this program. You can use it as a training tool. You can also use it as just a productivity tool. Remember we said reading with your finger is helpful if you've got an actual physical book. Uh, but it's not so practical on the screen, so you need another way to pace yourself. This is a perfect tool, and in the settings, you can adjust the speed to whatever you want. You can even practice some speed drills using this kind of a program. So you can get it for free uh, at accelerator.com. Let's move on now and talk about note-taking. So I'm going to go fairly briefly over this because there are some quick tips that can help you save quite a bit of time when it comes to taking notes. So you ever see notes that look like this? If you've ever bought a used college textbook, you've seen this before, right? How does this happen? Well, okay, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say you're reading, uh, you're reading through the material and you've got a test coming up and you read something and you're like, whoa, that is really important, I'm going to highlight that. And then you read the next sentence, turns out that one's pretty important too, so you highlight that as well. And now you read the third sentence and it turns out this sentence is way more important than the previous two, so now you might use a different color. And you see where I'm going with this. Uh, before you know it, you might have pages that look like what you see on your screen. Uh, how does, that, wh wh why does that happen? It's because people get caught up in the details. You ever hear that expression? When you get caught up in details, you lose sight of the big picture. 
This is one of the big problems when it comes to reading and note taking. Um, what I would suggest before you take any notes, if you're going to highlight or take notes anywhere else, wait until you finish a paragraph at least and then take some notes. Or maybe finish a whole section and then take some notes. You don't want to spend more than 20% of your study time taking notes. So think of it like if you were studying for an hour, 60 minutes, 20% is 12 minutes. No more than 12 minutes of your hour should be spent taking notes. So make sure you're taking notes strategically, not after a single sentence, but after a paragraph or after a section. So that's a more efficient way to do it. I know some students that they'll study for 60 minutes and half the time was spent note taking. So it's hard to make progress through your chapter when you're spending that much time on note taking. And a lot of times some people will never even go back to look at their notes because they look like this. You ever have the, I've looked at my notes from like high school years and stuff and I'm like, man, I don't even know where to start here. Uh, I'm just going to go back and read the chapter. And then the note taking was almost kind of useless. Well, uh, there's another question, how should I take notes? Not just when, but how. Uh, you might want to consider doing a mind map. Mind maps can be a very visual and effective way of organizing information. And if you've never seen a mind map, it looks something like this with an, a central idea in the middle. This might be the title of your chapter. And these might be headings. This might be section one, section two. Notice how I'm going clockwise, section three, section four. And anything else is maybe subsections. These are subcategories in your, you know, section one. So Mind mapping is a great way to take notes. If you like taking notes on the computer screen, I would. Uh, there's a lot of mind mapping programs out there. There are dozens. Uh, I've tested out a number of them. One of my favorite ones is XMind. This is not an Iris Reading product, but um, it's an, another organization. They have a free version, which actually has a ton of features. I've never had a reason to use the premium version, and the free version doesn't have like a, a time where it no longer works. It works on a Mac, a PC, this is, even works on the web. So check out xmind.net if you're looking for a mind mapping tool to organize your notes. And Actually, when you have a mind map, the nice thing is when finals roll around, you can just look at your mind map and that's a nice bird's eye view of what the chapter was about. So consider mind mapping as another note taking option. Now let's discuss how to memorize information. Uh, we've got a few more minutes left here on the webinar and I think you'll find this, this technique very helpful. It's called the memory palace technique, and it was actually used by the ancient Greeks. A few thousand years ago, they had this technique for remembering information. Now keep in mind, a few thousand years ago, you don't have nifty little tricks for remembering things, like uh, a phone where you can memorize everybody's phone number, um, or you know, just hard drives where you can store tons and tons of data. So they needed a way to recall information and they this was very widely taught and widely known as a technique unfortunately it's not as well known now although it has been popularized by some TV shows and things like that it's very effective let me explain how it works you take a location you're familiar with it can be your home it can be your office it can be your campus or it can be another place like a friend's place grandma's place your parents place now once you have that place in mind you gotta think of a, a mental walkthrough of that location. So I, I, you see here on the slide it says choose an order of sublocation. So imagine when you come home uh, from school or from work, what's the first thing you encounter? It might be, I don't know, the driveway or the lobby of the building or it might be, the, you know, something else. Let me give you an example of uh, mine. What I use for number one is my mailbox. So mailbox is the first thing I encounter, then there's the front door, the stairway leading to the living room, hallway, and so on and so forth. So you pick an ordered list of locations, a walkthrough of your home, and there's a reason why you would want to do this. Once you have that, now you need to memorize something. So whatever it is you need to memorize, you see all the green topics here? These things need to be associated to the location in your home. Or again, your memory palace might be, you know, it might be school, it might be your parents place, someone else's place. But it's best to start with your home or where you're living right now. So let me give you an example. Let's say the topic was technology. You're reading uh, some kind of material on the topic of technology. That's the general topic. And you're using the memory palace of your home to memorize some information from the chapter. And let's say number one is mailbox, two is front door, and so on. So if number one, let's say you need to remember for some reason that they talked about Apple first, and then they talked about the company Amazon, and then Facebook, and Twitter, and Netflix, and so on. Well, you need to associate Apple with the mailbox in some way. Now, Apple is, you know, we're obviously talking about the technology company. You can think of iPhones, MacBooks, or you can think of Apples. I would picture my mailbox, 
when I open it and a bunch of apples just falling out of it, the actual fruit. Now, you want to picture things that are a little, little weird, like that would never happen. I, I don't imagine I'll have a mailbox filled with apples at any point soon, unless someone's trying to prank me in some weird way. But the reason why you want to picture something weird or exaggerated is because your mind will remember things that are strange or exaggerated much, much better than something that's just run-of-the-mill normal. So when you get to the front door, you would picture something related with Amazon. So Amazon, you might think of the forest, or you might think of a, you might think of a giant box sitting on your front door from Amazon. And then when you get to a stairway, you've got to picture something related to Facebook. You might picture a bunch of people sitting on your stairway checking Facebook, or imagine maybe Mark Zuckerberg sitting there checking his Facebook, which would be kind of weird. Um, living room. If living room is number four, I would picture a bunch of birds, blue birds flying around in my living room. And then five would be the hallway. When I walk to the hallway, I would picture maybe, I don't know, a flat screen TV on the floor of my hallway, which doesn't make any sense, but that'll make it memorable. And I might picture, uh, I'll be vivid with these you know, images. I'll picture maybe uh, some kind of a series that I enjoy watching, like a house of cards or something. So you would continue doing this, and this is a good way to memorize information because you can have even subtopics. So what if you have to remember Amazon, but you also have to remember three things, three details associated with Amazon? Well, your front door, can you think of three areas of your front door? Well, those three areas have to be associated with the three details you need to remember. So I don't know, for my front door I have, like, there's a little window that's in the shape of like a, like a diamond. Uh, there's the doorknob, there's the doormat. So it's very easy to find, same thing if you got to your living room and you had to remember Twitter, but you had to remember these four things about Twitter. Well, you might have your uh, large couch, a coffee table, TV stand, and then the small couch. You pick four areas in your living room to associate the information. And associating information is, is how you remember information. Now, the great thing about the memory palace technique is you can have multiple memory palaces. You don't have to have just one. You could have, let's say you've got, a, you've got finals coming up, and you've got five different classes, and you've got to memorize one thing for this class, another thing for that class. Well, one memory palace could be for your history class. Another one could be related to some other class. Uh, your other one might be, I don't know, your aunt's place, grandma's place, your buddy's place, anything like that, and you could organize the information. You just need to make sure you have a mental walkthrough of those places, and then you can reuse memory palaces as well. Now, if you're looking for a good follow-up to today's webinar, this is the ideal way. Um, we have a package of 10 webinars in our Speed Reading Mastery course. This is um, actually the perfect way to follow up a class like we did. We went a little beyond the basics here, but the Speed Reading Mastery course is if you want to pretty much max out your reading speed and improve your memory as well. Uh, if you go to irisreading.com slash mastery, this is where you can find information about it. Let me go over the 10 videos that are in this course. They're very similar to what we're doing here, where although these are pre-recorded, they're not live, you can watch them at your own discretion. So they're anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes in length. The first one is how to read groups of words. Remember we said most people tend to read on a word-by-word -word basis? This webinar will teach you and show you training exercises that you can actually do in the session to help you read groups of words. The second webinar is how to reduce subvocalization, that voice in your head that limits you from reading a lot faster. The third video in the series is how to remember more through spaced learning. This is a concept to improve your memory. And the fourth video is essential eye training. You know, training your eyes through like hand-eye coordination to improve your reading speed. And then there's a webinar on learning to read and remember visually. If you liked that memory palace technique, there are a number of other memorization techniques you can utilize for remembering vocabulary, things in in a very precise order. They can help you with presentations, tests. Uh, that webinar is all about memorization techniques. The sixth webinar is how to sharpen your focus. So if you feel like you constantly have your mind wandering off while you're reading, this video will help you improve your ability to focus. And then there's a webinar on high-speed comprehension strategies. So once you start going a lot faster, how do you maintain that comprehension so you're not just skimming through text? And then there's also a webinar on the most efficient way to speed read through the news. So if you want to keep up with what's going on in the world, uh, news is actually structured in a very precise way and there's strategies for going about it. There's also a webinar on advanced level speed reading exercises. And our final webinar, this is our most popular one, is how to read a book in one day. So if you have, you know, I don't know, if you have a, a stack of books that you've been meaning to get through, but you don't have time because you've got a bunch of 
school related reading you need to get through uh, this is a great webinar that will show you some real interesting strategies for moving through more information so this entire series of webinars is available at irisreading.com slash mastery it's a package of 10 webinars and when we launched this course um, we had each video well, each presentation was $25, so it's a $250 package. Anyone in this webinar can get it for $40. Why? Because you've already learned some of the basics. And we actually, we're also planning on doing this as a special one because, you know, for college students, you've got more reading to get through than pretty much anyone else. And if you're looking for a really good deal, we're going to have this up on the website for a limited amount of time. Uh, that whole series, you can get it for $40, which I think is 84% uh, off the total package price. Um, so also it has a bonus PDF on how to remember names if you're interested in memory techniques for remembering lots of names at a time. So you can get that at irisreading.com slash mastery. Uh, let's summarize what we covered today. How fast do you currently read? Hopefully you know where your starting point is. We did that at the beginning of the webinar. We talked about how to read faster with better comprehension by slowing down and speeding up and how those speed drills can help you. Also how to read faster on the computer screen. That accelerator program is a good training tool and you can utilize it if you do a lot of reading on the computer screen. We also discussed how and when to take notes and a memorization technique called the memory palace. I hope you found a lot of this information helpful. I've got my contact information on the screen right now. If you have any questions, also we do these courses on campus. If you want to invite us to your campus to do a workshop for uh, an organization you're involved with or a department you're involved with, we'd be happy to organize something. Feel free to reach out to me. I've got my contact information on the screen right there. Uh, also, feel free to contact me by phone if you have any questions. And the follow-up course to this webinar, the next step, if you're wondering what that would be, is checking out the mastery course, which is at irisreading.com slash mastery. So I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. If you like what we're doing here at IRIS, we're still a relatively small organization. We've been growing a lot through word of mouth. Uh, but if you like what we're doing, please tell your friends about us. Uh, we'll have a recording of this video that you can share with them. If you don't like what we're doing, please tell your enemies about us because that'll, that'll show them. So thank you so much for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.